Welcome to Conversations That Matter. Joining me now is Mike Benier. Mike, welcome. Who is our guest today? Today, Stu, we have a gentleman from Calgary. His name is Cody Battershell, and Cody's a self-described mythbuster. He's by day a real estate agent in Calgary and seems <laughs> to spend every other waking minute of his life focused on fact-checking and making sure that the discussion about resources and future uh, oil and gas uh, activities in Canada is, is based in, in good information and, and hard data. And he's just sort of taken this on as a bit of a personal cause of his own. And he's probably what we'd call a classic citizen journalist. You know, he's created his own platforms on Facebook and, and Twitter. And, and his whole contention, I think it's really interesting in this concept of social media and how it's changing journalism. His whole context is social media is like this open spigot. And it's all this information coming at us. And we need better filters and, and, and better ways in which we can check the information and the facts that are coming out. And he's taking this on uh, and spending a lot on it. What's quite incredible about him is that five years ago, he knew very little about the oil industry, uh, oil and gas industry, yeah. and he's throwing himself into it. And the way that he like throws around facts and figures and can cite one report after another, it's quite extraordinary. He really believes that this is an important discussion that people need to have and, and have both sides of it. And he's a really positive guy just on his own. And he's not a corporate shill. He's not being paid by anybody in the oil and gas industry to, to speak on these issues. He doesn't work for any chamber of commerce or business association. I know. That's what's quite extraordinary it about is, this. It is. really amazing. It kind of reminded me, I studied history in college, and I remember this quote by Spiro Agnew in the 72 campaign in the U.S. where he talked about the negative nattering, the nattering nabobs of negativism. And, and all the media was just you know, complicit in this negativism. And this is a guy that's really positive, and he's really engaged in making sure that Canadians have the best information possible uh, on really what is essentially the, the core economic issue of the future for, for the country. Very interesting uh, conversation that we had with him. Let's go to that now. Well, thank you for joining me. You come into Vancouver from Calgary with a completely different perspective on what's happening in the oil and gas sector. Tell me a little bit about yourself as far as your background is concerned because you're not from that sector. What do you do for a living? Uh, I'm born and raised in Calgary. I've lived in Toronto as well for, for several years. Um, I've always had an affinity, uh, an appreciation for being a Canadian. I think we all appreciate our country and we, we know that we have it pretty good. I think sometimes there's some, some missing context though to that. So I was, in, I was in Vancouver in 2010, walking down Robson Street and I see a cosmetics company and they have the whole storefront stop the tar sands. At the time I knew nothing about the tar sands, nothing about the oil sands. It just, it just got my attention. I, I, I thought, I knew, I knew li almost nothing about oil and gas, but common sense says everything in that store is made possible by natural resources. Everything that we do is made possible by natural resources. And why is a cosmetics company with, you know, stores all over the globe on one of Canada's busiest tourist retail walking strips advertising to stop this natural resource from a different province. And so it just, it kind of piqued my interest. And I realized that the campaign was influenced by, um, by a, a special interest group. The campaign was predominantly uh, fear driven, uh, narr a fear driven narrative. And when you look at the, the, the very little context and very little fact, so a photo of a mining truck, stop the tar sands. And you have to actually look deeper to the context of the tar sands to understand that 97% of the land area can never be mined, never will be mined. And, and that's, that's just one of the first things that struck me. So, But you didn't know this at the time. You were just having an emotional reaction to what you saw. It just, it just piqued my interest. I, I thought, I'm in British Columbia. The tar sands is in Alberta. Canada is a top resource country in, in, in a variety of different important re natural resources. And it just, I just thought, why is this happening? And this was, this was also after 
the uh, ducks had landed on the tailings pond in 2009, 2009, 2010. So it was mm -hmm. about 1,600 ducks. And at the time, it was everywhere in the news. And we have to continually make sure that we are managing our natural environment to the best possible standards. But when you look at causes of avian death and you compare it to the 1600, I thought we're not having informed conversations. There's no context in this discussion. We need to talk about how we all live. Skyscrapers, airplanes, uh, food sources, wind turbines, house cats, uh, and the tailings pond. And, and so that, that was in the news. That was quite common. Then walking down the street and I saw this and I thought, you know, what's going on here? Okay, so you react, but is this the business that you're in? Are you an activist yourself? Or? Um, I, uh, so I, I, I'm a realtor and uh, I've been a realtor for 10 years. I started basically right out of high school and uh, I've never worked in my professional career as anything but a realtor. You sell houses? I sell houses. Um, work very hard and uh, I love my job. I love it. Um, so it's a little bit of a different venture for a realtor to, <laughs> to get into. There's a bit of a disconnect here. Like, were you doing any, were you doing okay selling houses? Like, where do you, where do you find the time, the interest, the energy to go out and do this? Ever since I became a realtor, I got very involved with, the, I've always been involved with volunteer organizations. Um, Kids Help Phone, Junior Achievement, Little Warriors, youth-based, youth-serving organizations. At the Real Estate Board, I was an instructor. I was president of one of the boards that we have there for our Critical Illness Benefit Society. Uh, I sat on almost 10 committees. I was elected to the Charitable Foundation Board of Governors. And what but, happened... But these are all kind of related to your work in the community. Community, community and children, base, you know, based organizations. And what happened in 2010 was, after seeing this storefront, this cosmetics company, opposing this Canadian resource and uh, the immense economic contribution that it makes to our country and uh, the royalties and taxes that it contributes to our governments. I've since then shifted all of my volunteer time, all of my volunteerism and activities into trying to add my voice into this conversation where I think we are having a lot of conversations that are not fully uh, informed or fully reasoned with uh, that are missing context and perspective and you know we really need to find that that solid foundation of, of fact so over the last five years you've gone from a novice at this you are having just an emotional reaction to now being a fairly well recognized voice as somebody who's standing up saying hey, hang on just a second, let's get off of the beat up the oil industry and here are the reasons why. Uh, has it been a pleasant journey for you? It's been a fun journey. Um, not always pleasant because there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of hatred out there and I don't get it, but uh, it's really become an us versus them type of conversation. And we're never going to get anywhere if it's always us versus them or me versus you or you're good, I'm bad. I find it, it, it all motivates me to continue to do what I'm doing, continue to talk to people in a factually sound, positive and optimistic manner because the world and everything that we do requires resources. So I believe that Canada, we are the most regulated, monitored, transparent and socially responsible top oil reserve. We as Canadians can create jobs at home, economic prosperity and opportunity at home, while making sure that we're managing our environmental impact to the best possible standard within a global context. And a lot of people will come out and say, well, the oil sands is uh, a carbon bomb that's going to destroy the planet. The oil sands is climageddon, Armageddon, the end of the world, apocalypse. And these are all misguided, fear-based statements that are not rooted or supported by, by any kind of factual context. So, 
uh, hang on, before we get there, yeah. you reach this point where you go, okay, I'm not liking the direction that the conversation yes. is going, and you start to get engaged. At what point do you now start to uh, build Canada Action? Where did that idea come from, and who's funding it? So, um, so, so I see, I see the, I see the campaign. I decide I'm going to add my voice to this conversation for several years, for for about three years. It's just me, a guy, Cody Battershell, Cody in Calgary on Twitter. I decide that I can really have a larger impact if I try to um, diversify out of just oil sands into other resources and make it more about Canada, make it more about uh, pride in our country and acknowledging our record and how we can continue to improve. Unfortunately, a lot of it is myth busting. We got a lot of myths to bust. There's a lot of misinformation out there we got we to gotta correct. But, so I decided to start Canada Action. But it costs money to do this. Where's the money coming from? Um, so I have, uh, I, I, I've lost count, but I've spent tens of thousands of dollars out of my own pocket. You're paying for it. My money on this and because you do know that there are people who look at you and go you're just showing for the uh, oil companies they must be paying for this uh my my last name has s-h-i-l-l -L in it and people always find that humorous mm -hmm. i find it humorous too there's there's nothing astroturf or fake about my passion for our country and i have put my money my time uh, and my actions where my mouth is why? Like, why is it so important that you put this much energy into it? Like, like, how do you get something out of this, other than the fact that you're part of the conversation? Well, and, and a target for criticism. Mm -hmm. um, when I noticed the conversations that were happening, I was concerned that, looking forward, if I didn't join in this conversation, and if other people like me don't join in this conversation, we might make decisions as a country that aren't fully based in, in fact, and we might look back later and regret the direction that we've taken. Because so are you saying that you're worried that we'll make decisions that could adversely affect the ability of the oil sector to stay in business and therefore there'll be an economic consequence? The oil sector, our natural resource sector, uh, you know, oil sands, it's all connected. Oil sands and, and natural gas exports, uh, pipelines and tankers, everything's connected. So, so let's take a look at the situation right now. As of today, while well, we're recording this interview, oil is now less than $48 a barrel. And yes. it is having an effect on uh, the oil and gas sector, particularly in Alberta. What lessons are you learning from where we're at right now about what the economic impact of a downturn in that sector are? Absolutely, and um, I think oil today closed about 46 and a half, and w the problem is that we're still selling our oil for even less than that. Canada has had the cheapest oil in the world for five years, and we have one customer, and that customer is going to need us less. That's right, we are selling it for less, because we're selling the, the it for agreement less. that we have with the United States, that they buy at a less than international price. They, they are our only customer. Mm -hmm. So the, the market forces dictate that they're paying less than we could get if we were selling it overseas. Mm -hmm. Right now with the downturn, it's interesting. I was reading today, thousands of British Columbians that work in the oil sands potentially looking at losing their jobs. And this isn't Alberta versus BC or, or Alberta versus Saskatchewan or Manitoba versus Saskatchewan. We're a country. We got to stick together. You know, we need, every province needs every other province. But are, are you not concerned at some level that we are uh, affecting the environment in a way that is detrimental to our long-term well-being, not just here in Canada, but globally? Like when you have been looking into this, mm -hmm. is that not something that comes up and makes you go, like consider what the impact is? And I've, I've toured and traveled to the oil sands uh, seven times. So when you look at um, oil sands contribution to global greenhouse gas emissions, today, right now, it is 0.15%. From? From oil sands. 
you're talking about the entire the entire Alabama oil sands uh, the the uh, entire oil sands production 0.15 percent less than two tenths of one percent of of greenhouse gas emissions globally Canada as a country 1.58 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions when we take a look at so many of the messages that we hear about the oil sands in, in Alberta, the message is that this is dirty oil, mm -hmm. that it is a blight on the global uh, ecological landscape, mm -hmm. and that it is probably the worst thing that you could do. And, and that message seems to be sticking. You're hearing European politicians, you're hearing President Obama yep. talking about dirty Canadian oil. We have to always pull that conversation back to one of, of fact and of informed conversation. When you look at the oil sands today, it's 0.15% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. It's been called not peanuts, but fractions of peanuts. It's been called almost undetectable. It's been called not the difference between stabilization and disaster. Um, Faith Burrell, the, the chief economist from the International Energy Agency, has said it's wrong to highlight the difference in greenhouse gas emissions from oil sands compared to other oil as a reason to not continue to, to proceed with, with oil sands development. So it's, it's really import, important that we look at um, the fear and the messaging that the oil sands is, gonna claw, is a climate bomb, a carbon bomb, and it's going to destroy the climate. 0.15% is, uh, it's, it's been called a rounding error. If you burned every barrel of oil sands reserve, it would add 0.02 degrees to the Earth's temperature and it would take 200 years at today's production level. So everything that we do has an impact. The burger I had for lunch yesterday has an impact. My car, the plane, all of our food, our homes, our clothing, everything has an impact. We need to make sure that the attention on these issues matches the impact so that we're having informed, intelligent conversations. And the global context, the world today is consuming about 92 million barrels of oil, Canada is producing about 4 million barrels, 2.3 of that's coming from the oil sands. And are we, are we spending time on environmental issues where we have the greatest chance of making the largest impact? I believe it's, it's not balanced and I work every day to try to dispel some of the myths that are out there. Do you think you're having an impact? I, I think we've had a tremendous impact and I love I love being proud of, of our country, being proud of our resources and all of the great high paying jobs that we have in Canada that are a result of our natural resource production. Uh, the Partnership for Resource Trade has said that there's almost two million jobs in Canada associated with natural resources. And for every person that insults me, swears at me or is rude, there's a hundred people that are sharing the content. This is not full steam ahead, forget everything, and it's also not saying no to everything. We need to find that balance. And I believe in Canada we have a strong balance of environmental protection and environmental balance with economic prosperity. So one of the things, people who are opposed to the ongoing development of the oil and gas sector in Canada and globally, say we are at this critical point where we're looking at an existential crisis. We could kill ourselves. Mm -hmm. And if that is part of the discussion, how then do we come up with an equation that demonstrates to somebody, here's how we make an informed decision, here's how we take the appropriate uh, risks and move forward in a way that allows us to realize our potential? You know, first of all, I would say let's ask the world's other top oil reserve countries to match what Canada's done. We are the only top 10 reserve with a carbon levy, carbon tax if you would call it that, on oil production. Yet I hear person after person after person saying Stephen Harper denies climate change, won't embrace the science, is opposed to any of these environmental considerations and, and yet you're saying we're out ahead of the pack. We, we are, we're, at, we're way ahead of the pack. We are light years ahead of the pack. How, how are we? ahead of the pack. So um, f first of all looking at um, oil and gas regulation. If you compare Canada to other producing jurisdictions, only places that you can really compare apples to apples. Canada came out ahead of Norway, North Sea, 
Dakota, Texas, Brazil, Oman, Qatar, Australia, we came out at the top in terms of global transparency and regulation and environmental law and procedures for compliance in energy regulation. Uh, who's, who's measuring that? Who, who says that so that we can verify? This, this study was done by Worley Parsons and CAP. So they looked at, they, they, they did a survey, and I, I regularly share this content on my Twitter account, but that's one metric. Another metric is, it's, it's quite easy to see. When you look at all of the top oil exporting countries to the US, we're the only country with a carbon levy on oil production. Then you start looking at transparency, monitoring, uh, compliance, regulation, and then, um, that's not even getting into the social responsibility side of things. You know, the oil is going to come from somewhere. The oil, uh, as long as the world needs oil, let's produce it in Canada. Let's produce as much of it as we can in Canada where we can, you know, balance production with jobs and with the environment and make sure we're doing things the best way we can. So you've gone from novice to somebody who is able to rattle off some facts pretty uh, easily. Uh, a lot of study. You must be spending a lot of time paying attention to this. I do. Um, I, a lot of people don't know this, but we're ninth in the world for wind power. Uh, we are top five for renewable power generation. When you look at the carbon tax we have on oil production, when you look at um, a lot of the things that we've done, we were the first country to ban the construction of new traditional coal-fired power plants. You look at the G20 group of countries, we are second lowest for coal power generation. And if, uh, if you are concerned about the climate, we need to figure out how we can get you know, more nuclear, more hydro, more natural gas, uh, electricity generation. We all use electricity. So I think there's a lot of things that we should really be proud of that we're not getting credit for. And you know, you see our regulatory institutions attacked. These are institutions that have existed for decades. We're the only country in the world where many of these groups are proposing to ban oil tanker exports. We're the only top oil reserve where most, if not all, of these uh, special lobby groups, special interest lobby groups, are working to disrupt oil production or block oil production. And uh, we're one of the only countries in the world that faces such sharp criticism in uh, you know, the export of our natural resources. You are without a doubt the most vocal supporter of the oil and gas sector I've <laughs> ever met. And the fact that you're willing to step outside of uh, your career to do this is quite extraordinary. And I want to thank you for taking the time and coming uh, to share with us what your perspective is on this. I really appreciate best. you having yeah. me. Thank you very Thanks much, Joe. Thank you.